Five Live Formula One. Welcome back to the Marina Bay Street Circuit and welcome back to Singapore where we have just watched the Singapore Grand Prix and I'm going to go bold. I'm going to say that was one of the best races we've seen for quite some time. We have a new winner in 2023, Carlos Sainz in the Ferrari. He was on pole position and he converted it to the race win. Was it ever in doubt? We're going to get to the bottom of that throughout the podcast. Behind him, it was Lando Norris in the McLaren, of course, heavily upgraded for this weekend. They seem to have worked. And behind Lando, fellow British driver Lewis Hamilton in the Mercedes. After a difficult start to the weekend, he managed to stand on the podium. It has been a while since we've seen him there. Plenty to discuss after that race. What an ending. There is a lot to unpick. And with me to talk through everything we've just seen is our lead commentator, Harry Benjamin, racing driver, Alice Powell, and BBC Sports Chief F1 writer, Andrew Benson. Guys, am I too bold? Have I gone too big too soon? Was that the best race of the season so far, Harry? Hands down. What a race. I loved it. Up at the first few laps, uh, I was a little bit, oh, I feel like this is a slow chess game. Something needs to happen. Then the safety car kicked things off for Logan Sargent Williams. And then it heated up. And we got a spectacular race. And just, I mean, the final laps, you know, four drivers, three different teams scrapping for the win. And not a Red Bull or a Max Verstappen in sight. <laughs> Come on. Yes, please. And of course, that's what we've all been hungry for this year. People have been crying out for a race where Red Bull weren't in contention. And this evening, that was the case. Max Verstappen starting outside the top 10 in P11 and his teammate Sergio Perez in P13. And they weren't able to make their way through the grid. Obviously, you mentioned, Harry, we had that stoppage, the sort of virtual safety car and, and safety car coming out. But Alice, it's a tricky track to overtake. Were you surprised, actually, that Max Verstappen managed to make it up to P5? No, because <laughs> there, it's Max Verstappen and it's Red Bull racing as well. They, they weren't looking too bad race pace-wise. OK, they, they struggled and Max described it as like driving on ice at points through that race on the, on the hard tyre. But uh, he was on much fresher tyres coming through the pack. So I knew he was probably gonna get into the top six fifth he just scraped in so but a good job from max um i think that their pace i hate to to go all a bit negative there but i think red bull's pace will be back probably in in japan let, let knows, us live in this cloud yeah, and yeah, bubble I'm for sorry. a little bit okay. longer come on rewind uh, rewind you can rewind. Tell me what you're going to say instead. <laughs> <laughs> the Red Bull are slow for the rest of the season, no. Uh, they, <laughs> they will be back. But, uh, but Carlos Sainz, he, he is the man of the moment because he did such a, a great job. OK, everyone said, yeah, but he's leading, he was leading the race. It's hard to overtake here. But it's a long race. It's, what, an hour and 46 minutes, I think, the, the race time was. He had a lot of pressure from numerous drivers behind his teammate at one point then he had Lando as well had George Hamilton especially in those those final laps but he kept it clean and he did something that was really really clever it was a point during the race where Ferrari said uh you know Lando is is now within DRS and I think that was probably with like four laps left something like that and Carlos said yeah I know that it's planned and then I suddenly thought ah I know what he's doing and he was basically creating that that DRS train and we've seen it at tracks like Monza when people go oh they're in a DRS train it makes it harder to overtake so I think George then was stuck behind Lando Lando had the DRS of Carlos okay it could have gone all wrong but he clearly felt very comfortable within his Ferrari to just sort of continue to control the pace. He did say that his fronts had gone off at, at one point with the two laps to go. But he was very clever in doing that because I think essentially you could say that that sort of won him the race because those Mercedes streamed up to the back of them. But once they had that DRS train was created, it was hard for them to pass. Yeah, super impressive stuff. And Andrew, I mean, even more impressive, I think, given we spent a lot of the weekend saying how Carlos Sainz is uh, harder on his tyres and his teammate Charles Leclerc, and perhaps it would have been Charles who might have won out today. But of course, Carlos did start on pole position. But how impressed were you by his drive this evening? Well, it was very, very impressive drive by Carlos Sainz and also a very impressive race by Ferrari. It's the sort of race that in the past they might have messed up. Think back to Monaco last year 
when they had a front row lockout and somehow managed to turn that into fourth place from pole position for Charles Leclerc. Um, they went into the race with a very clear plan. Leclerc was to be sacrificed to help Sainz win the race. That's what was all, all those radio message were, messages were about in the first part of the race about building a gap. Uh, Leclerc didn't exactly build the gap initially that they wanted, but he backed up the pack a lot when that safety car happened. Sainz has something like nine seconds when it had been three uh, when, when he finally came into the pits. That gave him the breathing space to get into the pits and get out in front with Verstappen then moving up into second. Leclerc dropped back as a result of that. But even so, Sainz felt he was under control. The big jeopardy for him came with the VSC later in the race, the virtual safety car, when Ocon's Alpine retired. That gave Mercedes a chance to stop again for fresh medium tyres, which they'd saved alone among all the teams for the race. And um, then Sainz Should knew he had a battle on his hands, Rosanna, and he managed it incredibly well, giving uh, Lando Norris the DRS there at the end to ensure that he won the race. Do you think Ferrari should have pitted Charles Leclerc? We heard him on the radio saying he thought taking a medium like the Mercedes did would have been the right option. Should Ferrari have kind of hedged their bets there? Were you in agreement with Charles? Well, he was already behind the Mercedes, wasn't he, at that point? So it wouldn't actually have probably gained him anything. Um, and he was saying that after the race. I think he was a bit, he was accepting of his situation after the race and pleased for the team. Disappointed more with himself, I think, for not nailing qualifying because whichever Ferrari driver ended up on pole was going to be the Ferrari driver who won the race as long as things were managed expertly, and they were today. I'm they fascinated. Sorry, Rosanna. I'm fascinated by this Ferrari dynamic now because it all came undone for Leclerc in qualifying, and undone is less than a tenth of a second off of pole position, which his teammate managed to pull out of the bag. And back-to-back -back poles for, for Carlos Sainz, who seems to have found another gear maybe since uh, the summer break. And I think we, we've had this discussion time and time again. Ferrari is Charles Leclerc's team. He's the Ferrari golden boy. They brought him in up through the junior ranks, but Sainz is, is giving them a headache in a very good way. And I don't know, I feel like we've got a new Carlos Sainz with us now off the back of two very impressive races. Make that three impressive races actually in Zandvoort where he was the better of the of the Ferraris once again. He is incredibly, he was already incredibly consistent and he's he thinks like an engineer. He's smart. That DRS trick at the end, the managing of the pace, the uh, at times across the year we've seen him go against what his engineer has told him to, where Charles Leclerc has just gone with whatever Ferrari has said and more often than not, Leclerc is the one who pays the price for that. I'm fascinated to see how this dynamic unfolds and whether uh, Sainz uh, ca can steam ahead as perhaps uh, the, the leader of the Ferraris over the rest of this year. Ooh, how about that? Well, let's hear from Carlos Sainz then winning in Singapore. I'm sure there are a few challenges for him this evening. Well, the challenges were mainly to control the, the pace and the, the pace of the Mercs and the degradation, that extra degradation and, and tire deck that we have. We definitely manage it uh, to perfection. I mean, if we... we were under pressure many, many times, but we just kept it cool and I knew exactly what I had to do. And, um, and yeah, just committed to my plan and, and it worked. A little thank you letter heading to Lando Norris later <laughs> on? Mutual thank you because I did help him too with the RS, you know. Uh, I, uh, I really tried to keep him just on 0 0.9, 0 0.8 uh, in my DRS to make sure that uh, Russell and Lewis were not passing him because if they were passing him, then I knew I was nearly dead meat so uh, I needed him to to stay on my DRS and defend well and that's what we did and a bit of Carlando action there that uh, gave us a one two. Can Ferrari fans get excited that there are more wins to come for the rest of the season do you think? Uh, I don't know I think it's too early to tell we will have uh, other opportunities uh, I'm confident but uh, our normal position is not to fight for four positions and wins we've seen it this year but if the a challenge or if the opportunity comes, we know that we can do it and we will try again. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Well, Carlos Sainz on the top step of the podium ahead of one of his great friends, Lando Norris. Carl Lando in full effect. Guys, I don't know about you, but I didn't really see that podium for McLaren coming. Um, I don't know why. It felt a little anonymous, I think, the race up until a certain point for Lando Norris. And then there he goes and takes second place in the McLaren. Of course, upgraded this weekend. Alice, how much do you think that's helped them around this track? It seems to have helped them a lot. I know Oscar will probably be begging for those to be thrown on his car the next round in Japan, which I, I think they will be. He finished down in seventh place. But... You know, it was always going to be a good scrap. Lando's sort of been there or thereabouts 
all weekend, I would say. The McLaren's been sort of around, hovering around that fifth place. And what did help him is because the the Mercedes decided to box and he thought, do you know what, I'm, I'm staying out here because they clearly felt that it was the, the best thing to try and get on the podium. And, and clearly it was. But he stuck there, didn't he? He clung on to the back of, of Carlos Sainz and, and, and did a really good job. So I think we shouldn't forget that we were always focusing on, on Carlos, who did, yeah, don't get me wrong, outstanding race, driver of the day for me. But Lando, he did a really good job as well, just sort of clinging on the back of this group and then uh, getting himself a deserved podium. Great defence from Lando Norris as well uh, against George Russell and Lewis Hamilton. But he was obviously under pressure, Andrew, wasn't he? Because he clipped the wall at one point or brushed it. Um, so uh, obviously still pretty uh, intense for Lando in the McLaren. Yeah, it was a quiet drive, but a very mature and impressive one, I think. Um, I mean, he, he, gained, he gained those positions up to second because of the problems for Leclerc as his first pit stop when uh, he'd backed the pack up, as I said, and then uh, he had to be held in his... Uh, pit as the uh, Mercedes drivers got ahead and then he gained it again by uh, the Mercedes drivers pitting for their second tyre for their second set their third set of tyres sorry but there was a point in those closing laps where Russell looked like he was going to pass uh, Norris into the final chicane and somehow Norris held him back it turns out Norris had pressed the overtake button at that point and he thinks Russell got a uh, hit a bump and uh, so lost a bit of grip and that he managed to hold on um, and uh, then, as you say, Rosanna, he hit the wall uh, going into turn 10 on the penultimate lap, managed to hold on to the car, didn't damage the car, so obviously didn't hit it quite as hard as George Russell did when he uh, hit it on the last lap and crashed out. Spoiler alert. We hadn't mentioned that yet, but we will. We will talk about George Russell ending his race prematurely uh, when he was on course to be on that podium. Could he have even taken the win? Um, yeah, big moment for George Russell. We'll discuss that a little later on. But Lando Norris, we've spoken about that upgrade, Harry. Exciting times. He was excited coming into this weekend. Oscar Piastri is going to be excited for next weekend. Are we going to see double podiums then for McLaren in the next sort of few races? Oh, well, um, probably not. I mean, I think <laughs> a lot, the last time McLaren introduced upgrades of this of this sort, Lando got them first in Austria. Os Oscar got them again at the following race uh, at Silverstone. Uh, and immediately, uh, Norris, what was uh, was front row start, wasn't he? Uh, led the race for a brief period and got on the podium uh, in Silverstone and followed that up with another uh, win in Hungary as well after the upgrades were introduced. So I think uh, what they brought, which is pretty much a bit of everything to that new car, front wing, side pod, floor, you name it, uh, well, continues to underline the impressive rate of McLaren's um, development. Think back yeah. to Bahrain. What a disaster that was. They were the, one of the slowest teams. And to now be finishing, uh, you know, second on the podium and be fighting uh, and making their way. They've got a bit of a gap to bridge to, to Aston Martin for fourth and the constructors, but it's not, it's not out of the question. Um, and Piastri will get the upgrades. And he, want, he, you know, he was actually, he was a beneficiary in this race of those that retired around him and perhaps of the Red Bull's lack of pace because he sort of was out of the points from the majority of the race and then managed to get seventh at the end. So it was a good job for him to hold on. But seventh with a, a non-upgraded McLaren and second with an upgraded McLaren, well, that bodes well going forward. But I do fear, as we discussed, that once we go to Japan, we kind of return to normal service resumes. And... Uh, it's going to be oh, tough. Oh, Harry. Oh, come on. No, no, no. We, ha we, we, ha we held the hope for the first five minutes, but now we can give us reality. Um, <laughs> but I, I, well, I don't think two podiums for, for, for McLaren are going to happen in Japan. Well, of course, this upward trajectory and performance has been masterminded and overseen by Andrea Stella, their new team principal. I managed to grab him as he jumped off the pit wall and headed to join in the celebrations in Park Fermi and around the podium. This is what he had to say to me. It was uh, quite tense, you know, and uh, a couple of events during the race... Uh, uh, gave us an opportunity to end up um, on the podium. Uh, close call at the virtual safety car, staying out, pitting. Merce for Mercedes, it was easy because they had another set of medium. So I think for them it was a straightforward call. Uh, you know, it worked, but it could have not worked. And uh, good collaboration between uh, Lando and Carlos also. You know, with Carlos uh, uh, making sure that Lando had the DRS, so to keep the two Mercedes behind. Uh, great work by everyone trackside but let me take the chance to thank everyone at the factory the whole team that uh, made these upgrades possible and it's thanks to that that today we are going to celebrate the podium 
Lando said he had a little bit of a touch with the wall. Was that a, a scary moment for you guys on the pit wall? It was scary, plus we were seeing him in the straight uh, weaving a bit. Uh, hopefully, it was just to check that everything was okay. Uh, so, yeah, it added to the tension, but it's, yeah, ultimately, it was all right. So, we are enjoying this good result. And, of course, this upgrade, obviously, bringing you a podium. Oscar gets it next weekend, so things are looking even better for McLaren at the moment. Uh, you know, on the paper, Suzuka should be a track that uh, should suit our car better. Uh, but this Formula 1 seems to be quite unpredictable, so uh, we will discover in a few days, but we look forward to it. So that was McLaren team boss Andrea Stella. Now let's hear from his star driver of the day, Lando Norris, coming home P2. Just a great race, yeah. Of course, I'm happy at P2. Um, yeah, amazing. Like, I didn't... It wasn't going to be possible to finish P2 just on pace, because uh, it's too difficult to overtake, but... Uh, we finished P2 with a perfect pit stop. We got heavily plug, so that was kind of the first one ticked off. And um, the second bit was uh, as soon as George boxed him ahead of me to try and keep him behind at the end and stressful. Um, difficult few laps, but uh, yeah, no paid off. So a uh, des deserved race and deserved result for, for the whole team. And is it circuit specific? Is it upgrade related? What can I we mean, expect? We've been quick since we brought the last upgrade to the car. Um, this has just helped us take another little step, so uh, a bit of both. So let's now then, seeing as we've covered off P1 and P2, let's cover off the rest of the podium. And that was Sir Lewis Hamilton. But it wasn't looking that way, was it, guys, with a few laps to go. George Russell chasing down Lando Norris. But then suddenly the cameras all sort of swiveled and we saw George Russell in the wall. Uh, not what we we're expecting. You don't really expect that. I mean, maybe you expect it from a rookie, but not from George Russell in the Mercedes where he's been feeling so confident all weekend. Getting rid of a podium in the last of the 11th hour and it was Lewis Hamilton who benefited. Oh, Georgie boy. Um, <laughs> yeah. He was and, heartbroken. Heartbroken in the media pen. And because, because it was a, it was driver error. It was a mistake. One that Norris nearly made the lap previous. Or, uh, and uh, slightly grazing that, uh, that there's a bit of wall that just sort of juts slightly out at an angle as you approach turn 10, the left-hander, which for those who've been following Singapore since 2008, that was the old Singapore sling chicane, which used to hurtle you into the, the other wall a bit further around. And... Uh, yeah. I, don't, I mean, Russell, mistakes aren't common by any stretch of the imagination. But I wonder if that pressure, I think he told himself at the start of this race, he, this was his race to win, starting alongside Sainz. And then suddenly at the end, he's got a McLaren in front of him and then a, 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 his teammate behind him in Lewis Hamilton, who hasn't had the pace, but is suddenly right there with him and, and, and looking for a move. Because let's not forget, in those last couple of laps, he was really hounding Russell. Yeah, yeah, and, and do you know what? So George Russell, obviously on the radio, talking about what's he got to do to win this race. What does, what does the team need him to do? We're going to hear from George Russell very shortly. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll hear from him and his teammate, Lewis Hamilton. So let's hear from George Russell then. So close to taking a podium, maybe even a win this evening, but he leaves Singapore with zero points. Let's hear what he had to say to me. Yeah, lost for words, to be honest. I think we were half a car's length away from winning the race. Had I been able to overtake Lando when I had that one opportunity, uh, because Carlos did such a great job at dictating the pace, giving Lando the DRS, um, that we couldn't give a chance to overtake Lando. And then you know, last lap, I don't know what the hell happened there, just like, whether it was a lack of concentration, maybe frustration, frustration knowing that was our opportunity gone. You know, mistake of one or two centimetres is just put a, such a shadow on the whole weekend. One of which would have been an amazing weekend. The team did an amazing job. The car was great. The strategy was was bang on. We were aggressive. We were bold, and it was exciting. You know, it was really exciting out there, and just yeah, it's heartbreaking to be standing here uh, with no points. Definitely sums up the season I've been having this year. Um, but as I said, there's definitely positives to take away. But, yeah. Well, George Russell, pretty speechless, pretty heartbroken, so down. And that is because there was such a high coming his way, wasn't there? Yeah, there was. And it's uh, we all make mistakes. We've seen Fernando Alonso, the most experienced driver on that grid. He made a mistake, didn't he, getting his five-second penalty. But it's a long race, an hour and 46 minutes of racing. It's a hot race. 
And Lando did the something similar the lap before. So maybe he just, he was just distracted ever so slightly. And that one slip of concentration, you know, if that was grass, he would have got away with it. But because it's a barrier and it does jink out there as you go into the entry of turn 10. And yeah, off he went. He had, there was no way of him rescuing it because it broke his, his, his front right instantly. And he sailed off into the barrier. And there's no one else that he can blame apart from himself. So hugely disappointing for, for George. And that's points as well in the Constructors' Championship that uh, that Mercedes have lost too. Yeah, absolutely. Losing them to Ferrari. Uh, I feel, though, there are positives for George to take away. In the same sort of vein as Carlos Sainz, coming back from the summer break, renewed, reinvigorated, with extra confidence. I feel like George, with this little hiccup, I think he's on the up, isn't he? He is, yeah. He's it, but Between him and Lewis, it's been... 7-7, seven, seven, okay, it was 8-7 now to, to George in, in terms of qualifying, but he has sort of had the legs the past couple of qualifying sessions over Lewis Hamilton, so you could say it's somewhat of, of an up, but this is going to hurt for, for for a while, but he doesn't have a lot of time to, to shake it off, turn himself around, dust himself off and, and get back into Japan, which is next week, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one to, to take for him because, OK, he, he probably wouldn't have won the race because it looked like that Carlos had that settled and, and, and done. He probably wouldn't have got the Lando, but it's a podium. It's a, still a podium at the end of the day. You're up there celebrating in front of your team. You've worked really, really hard on the lead up and through the weekend. So it, it, it's a tough one. It's going to hurt. And a non-score as well, actually, is, is even more crucial in this fight for second in the Constructors because Ferrari have made gains this weekend. 24 points is now all the difference between second Mercedes and third uh, for Ferrari at a time where Ferrari seem to be on the up with both cars, whereas Mercedes, OK, yes, they are very much still in the fight. But Hamilton complaining almost every weekend about the inconsistencies from his Mercedes and he finds something in FP1 then it goes away from him across the weekend it obviously started to come back to him a little bit more in the race but clearly it's still an inconsistent car for Lewis Hamilton at least uh, this battle for second uh, is going to be really tasty yeah it really is I think um going to be interesting to see how the rest of the season plays out. I mean, we've got the championships to be wrapped up, no doubt, by Max Verstappen and Red Bull, but just so interesting these cars that just lack consistency and the drivers that lack confidence in them, of which one of them is Lewis Hamilton. It seems just unbelievable that he's finding it so difficult to tame yet another Mercedes car. P3 for him today. Let's hear he, how he found the Grand Prix this evening, especially those last few laps. Exciting at the end for us as a team. I, I was hoping that I knew that I wouldn't be able to get George because it's uh, you need a big big delta to overtake, but I thought we might be able to get a one too. Um, but unfortunately, we can do it. Have you got a fair few things of understanding why maybe this weekend hasn't gone as smoothly as you'd hoped and things you obviously to work on always, but specific things about where you might be lacking? Yeah, I mean, qualifying is... Uh, I think qualifying is pretty... is a big weakness for me. And... Um, making lots of changes with the car, which we did a big change yesterday, and then it was like learning a whole new car again, and it um, wasn't particularly enjoyable to drive, but it was good today. But um, So there's, there's definitely pros for the things we changed. It's just getting on top of that and um, figuring out how to maximize qualifying. Once I get my qualifying sorted, then maybe will be good. So let's bounce through the order then. Behind Lewis Hamilton, it was Charles Leclerc in the second Ferrari, P4 for him, ahead of Max Verstappen, who did a good job to wrestle that Red Bull up to P5, starting P11 this evening. But could we have expected more? I mean, he does remarkable things with this RB19, doesn't he? Could he have gone even further, do you think? Well, I don't think the race worked out as well as it could have done for him, Rosanna, because of just the timing of the safety cars. So their, their plan at Red Bull was to run as long as they could on that hard tyre. Um, Sainz was already making that hard for them by managing his tyres as much as possible. Um, but then when that safety car came out, that sort of locked Red Bull into having to not stop. Um, and then he was on old tyres and everyone could pass him. Um, and then the VSC as well at the end didn't help them. Um, I think the bigger question is why Red Bull weren't competitive this weekend, and there's still a bit of a mystery. It's you know it's pretty clear that um, 
Uh, they, they expected a tricky weekend uh, coming into Singapore, but they didn't expect it to be this tricky. And they've admitted, both Christian Horner, the team principal, and Paul Monaghan, the chief engineer, that they've made mistakes with the setup this weekend. It seems they did that chasing um, more performance than maybe the car could have given. And if they'd maybe settled with a slightly different setup, uh, they might have done a bit better in qualifying. So they ran the car too low, basically, in qualifying, and uh, that's what scuppered them. Maybe he could have qualified higher up. Up and down the pit lane, there are people asking questions as to why it was quite so bad for Red Bull. And of course, they're pointing their fingers at a new technical directive that came out Ooh, ahead of yes. this weekend, which was to do with flexible bodywork. Now, flexible bodywork is something that Red Bull have excelled at for, well, as long as I can remember, the last 15 years or so. Um, and people are uh, wondering, has that had an effect? Now, of course, Horner says it hasn't. Um, uh, he might we, say that, mightn't he? <laughs> exactly. But, you know, we won't know it really until we see the pattern of the next few races. Sing, uh, sorry, Suzuka uh, next weekend won't pose the same challenges to Red Bull as Singapore. It's got long corners, high speed. It'll play to Red Bull's strengths. So we might not even see it there. I would expect Red Bull to, to um, shoot back to the front of the field. But over the next few races, as they play out, um, let's just keep an eye on that and see whether it looks like Red Bull's disadvantage. Uh, sorry, see what, and look at see whether um, Red Bull's advantage has reduced a little bit. Mm, time to keep a watchful eye on things. Well, let's hear how Max Verstappen reflected on his race this evening in Singapore. I think we were a bit unlucky with the safety cars two times. Otherwise, I think we could have done more because uh, the pace on on the medium was actually quite good. Uh, had quite a bit of fun out there, but. Yeah, two times the safety car this time didn't help us. Of course, you know, we went on the alternate strategy and then you need to hope that it, it all works in your favor. And today, I think uh, it didn't. But yeah, that, uh, that happens sometimes. I think overall, the car was a little bit better in, in the race again, uh, which I guess is uh, the most important. At the moment, are you kind of feeling like this is just an off weekend, very track specific? Or do you mm. think kind of going forward, there is a lot of work to do to try and understand where you're losing. No, I, I think it's just we really have to understand this weekend. Uh, Suzuka is, of course, a completely different track layout. So P5 for Max Verstappen, P6 for Pierre Gasly. Great day for him in the Alpine, but his teammate having uh, a problem with a gearbox issue, he had to stop, so he uh, finished prematurely. And then Oscar Piastri, P7. More things to come from him, I'm sure, in the McLaren when he gets the upgrade next weekend in Suzuka. Then Sergio Perez, P8, started P13, but just couldn't make the same headway as Max Verstappen on that hard tyre from the start. What do we put that down to? Is that a dangerous question? <laughs> uh, uh, lack of ability, Rosanna. <laughs> oh, 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 he did he, the lowest. He did this to, to, to Lance <laughs> yesterday, and he's gone uh, <laughs> straight in. Who's next week? I'm just talking comparatively compared to Verstappen. <laughs> you know, you, you see it yeah. all the time. Whenever one of them or both of them are down the field. Verstappen makes much more progress, much more quickly than Perez does. He's just, just better, basically. It's, just, it's down to that. What I would say about Perez, um, and it's, look, I have to say, I don't think it's a particularly scandalous suggestion to say that Max Verstappen is better than Sergio Perez. I'd, li I'd like you to find someone in the paddock, Rosanna, <laughs> who disagreed with me on that one. What I would say about Perez is that he, he's very good at defending and he put up a great job defending from Esteban Ocon and Fernando Alonso, although initially the other way around, um, through the middle part of the race when he was on old tyres, uh, before he finally had to give up and they pitted him. So um, that, I'll give him that for sure. Oh, well, there we go. High praise indeed from so Andrew Benson. <laughs> um, Perez yeah, actually, so uh, he was the car that made contact with Sonoda on lap one And then well. Albon. And Albon. So it wasn't, it, wasn't they, a, a, uh, it wasn't a tidy race from Perez either. And they have been at the stewards. We are awaiting at this point a decision on that. I mean, if he doesn't, well, um, if he doesn't aren't get... aren't going to turn up, are they? <laughs> well, no, if he doesn't get a penalty for the Albon incident, he just sent it into the side of him. So he should get a penalty for that. But who knows? Yes. Well, time will tell. Hopefully, when you're listening to this podcast, you shall know as well. Uh, so, P8 for Sergio Perez. Uh, just a note on that, actually. I think it kind of went unnoticed that Perez had that little spin in qualifying yesterday because the Red Bull in general was not performing. So, another little mistake from Checo. So, it wasn't even a perfect weekend in terms of his own performance, let alone the cars. Uh, behind him, though, da -da -da -da, Liam Lawson, P9, taking his first points in Formula One. 
and let me tell you guys, it's still so hard on themselves, these Formula One drivers. In the media pen, Liam was saying, I've just got to work on my starts. You know, if I've got another opportunity, I really need to focus on my starts, sort them out. And I thought, mate, enjoy this moment. You've just scored points in an Alpha Tari <laughs> in your third race in Formula One. But they're so, they just love to nitpick, don't they? He did get a bad start uh, in, in, in his, uh, in his defense. He did. Uh, I mean, even to get into the top 10 in qualifying was impressive for him uh, and not make a mistake, unlike his teammate, the more experienced Yuki Snowder did, who made a mistake in qualifying. But uh, Lawson, fantastic. I mean, three starts, uh, kept kept it clean, had some good fights. He even had a little scrap with Max Verstappen, very briefly. I think it lasted <laughs> two corners and a short straight and the writing was always on the wall. But Lawson did just enough to get his elbows out and showcase, well, I know this is Max Verstappen, I know this is Red Bull, who are the people that have got me in this seat, but just so you know, I can race against Verstappen as well, but I'll, I'll let him through. And in the end, he's rewarded with a couple of points for it. Um, not, not, I don't want to see Daniel Ricciardo back, but I would like to see Lawson get another run out as well off the back of this. I, I think he, he has earned that. Um, becomes the 350th driver to score points in Formula One. Well, congratulations, Liam Check Lawson. With the stats. <laughs> yeah, exactly. More of those, please, Harry Benjamin. Um, then P10, Kevin Magnussen, obviously benefiting from the fact that George Russell uh, crashed out. So he got the last point available. Just outside the points, Alex Albon, P11 for him. P12, Joe Guan Yu, Nico Hulkenberg behind him in the Haas, Logan Sargent making a mistake that was pretty costly as they always are around this place uh, and brought out that first safety car or the safety car uh, and then Fernando Alonso also making mistakes uh, said there were lots of things to learn I think from this weekend. Uh, so P15 for him and then our non-finishers, George Russell P16 in the wall, Valtteri Bottas uh, retiring, Esteban Ocon as well, Yuki Tsunoda two and Lance Stroll didn't take the start because of that crash in qualifying yesterday he was still feeling the after effects so there we have it Singapore Grand Prix complete first race of the double header over this way uh, and we're heading to Suzuka next weekend they come thick and fast now so totally different circuit yet again I seem to say this a lot each weekend we've gone from Monza to Singapore now we're moving to Suzuka a great track but um, who's going to go well there well actually before that let's do driver of the day it was a muddled up moment wasn't it but do we reckon it's Carlos Sainz are we unanimous yeah I, I think so he did a great job leading from the front he was stand withstood sorry a lot of pressure and he kept it there and he and that bit of genius uh, you could say yeah engineering strategy I would say was a bit of both at the end with the, the DRS there was was great yeah the DRS uh, wins it for sure I mean I think he, he would have got driver of the day anyway but uh, I think Mercedes think that they would have won the race had Sainz not done that with Lando Norris because uh, Norris would have been more vulnerable to Russell and Hamilton and that would have then made Sainz vulnerable to Russell and Hamilton so that was a master stroke to end a masterful drive I, I will also say obviously Carlos Sainz but I would like to give a special shout out to Kevin Magnussen in the Haas for stealing the <laughs> final point so crucial for Haas who managed to edge it's only a point but it's another point ahead of Alfa Romeo who are only two points behind them in the constructors and to be quite frank with you don't know how Magnussen managed to get that P10 back. He did it in the uh, final laps when we were focusing on the front. So well played to Magnussen. Yeah, super satisfying for Kev. Right, so we do move to Suzuka. There we go. We can look ahead to Japan, a racetrack that uh, I think it excites a lot of people. Uh, it's an amazing place to visit. What are you guys looking forward to most? Uh, producer Paddy showing us around Suzuka and Tokyo, and that's what I'm looking, most looking forward to. <laughs> And the the tour around Suzuka there. might be fairly fairly short, but the rest of Japan, I'm sure we'll find a lot of time to, to take in uh, a bit of the sights and sounds. But it's a great racetrack, isn't it? That figure of eight, some real kind of iconic names, 130R, the S's. I'm, I'm loving all of that. It's one of the highlights of the season, Rosanna. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. Although I don't think um, there's that much hope of another non-Red Bull victor there, unfortunately, for people who want... Um, uh, close competition. Uh, I would expect Red Bull to be back to their sort of dominant ways. Um, just to be clear about this, you know, it's, we're not. No one's anti Red Bull. It's just everyone wants a fight, and this season was developing into not very much of a fight at all, wasn't it? With the uh, ten consecutive uh, victories for Max Verstappen. 
Yeah, we need to drink this one in. Savour the moment. Savour Singapore. Uh, it's been a great weekend from start to finish. This has been an IMG production for BBC Radio 5 Live. My thanks to Andrew Benson, Alice Powell, Harry Benjamin for talking us through the race. And uh, I've been Rosanna Tennant, a little hot and sweaty down in the pit lane and paddock, but it's been great talking to you over the course of the weekend. We'll be back for the Japanese Grand Prix.